is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, chapters 7 through 12. Brought to you by Denise Gonzalez. In these chapters, well, I guess it's inevitable. Several read two members of our heroine's family have either died or disappeared. It was going to happen, but it was no easier to read for all that. Welcome to Spoil Me. All right, welcome to the show, everybody. My name is Natasha, and um, yeah, it's, it was a little while since the last time that I covered these chapters. Um, the section that um, I started with seven, I'm like interested in the concept of this god that she's creating. It's all so esoteric at this point that. I'm not exactly sure what to say about this, but the opening of this chapter, we are all God's seed, but no more or less so than any other aspect of the universe. God's seed is all there is, all that changes. Earth seed is all that spreads earth life to new earths. The universe is God's seed. Only we are earth seed, and the destiny of earth seed is to take root among the stars. Which is an interesting idea that that's our destiny. I kind of don't want that to be true because I feel like we are no good and do not deserve to spread ourselves across the universe. But, you know, I I don't know. It's like, what is good? How subjective is that? Are any creatures out there good? I feel like we're just so destructive that the idea of our population being transferred to other planets in order to inevitably suck them dry of all their resources does not seem awesome to me. Um, But she says, I am earth seed. Anyone can be. Someday, I think there will be a lot of us, and I think we'll have to seed ourselves farther and farther from this dying place. I've never felt that I was making any of this up. Not the name earth seed, not any of it. I mean, I've never felt that it was anything other than real. Discovery, rather than invention. Exploration, rather than creation. I wish I could believe it was all supernatural, that I'm getting messages from God, but then I don't believe in that kind of God. All I do is observe and take notes, trying to put things down in ways that are powerful, as simple, and as direct as I feel them. I can never do that. I keep trying, but I can't. I'm not good enough as a writer or a poet or whatever it is I need to be. I don't know what to do about that. It drives me frantic sometimes. I'm getting better, but so slowly. Which that just feels like a really personal message from the writer. Just that feeling of, oh, I want to do this and it's inside my head, but I am not competent enough to get it out on paper the way that it needs to be. Yeah, I feel you on that. Um, Why is the universe to shape God? Why is God to shape the universe? I can't get rid of it. I've tried to change it or dump it, but I can't. I cannot. It feels like the truest thing I've ever written. It's as mysterious and as obvious as any other explanation of God or the universe that I've ever read, except that to me, the others feel inadequate at best. All the rest of Earthseed is explanation. What God is, what God does, what we are, what we should do, what we can't help doing. Consider, whether you're a human being, an insect, a microbe, or a stone, this verse is true. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Honestly, I like that. That feels very true. I agree with her about this. Um... When she says, I've written, I've written plenty of useless stuff in those books, getting my high school work out of the way. Now I'll put one to better use. Then someday when people are able to pay more attention to what I say than to how old I am, 
I'll use these verses to pry them loose from the rotting past and maybe push them into saving themselves and building a future that makes sense. That's if everything will just hold together for a few more years. Yeah, that's a big if. So she starts to put together a, a go pack um, that's got pots and pans, toothpaste, tampons, matches, uh, an extra pair of shoes, uh, food, notes, plastic storage bags, maps, seeds to plant, um, pillowcases, and just all of this stuff, even money. Um, she asks her father for a gun and he won't let her keep one because it's in the room that her brothers can get into and he does not trust any of them. And she goes very carefully at this point and we find out how important this is later. Um, my brothers have been taught how to behave around guns all their lives, but Greg is only eight and Ben is nine. Dad just isn't ready to put temptation in their paths yet. Marcus at 11 is more trustworthy than a lot of adults, but Keith at almost 13 is a question mark. He wouldn't steal from dad. He wouldn't dare, but he has stolen from me. Only little things so far. He wants a gun, though, the way thirsty people want water. He wants to be all grown up yesterday. So maybe dad's right. I hate his decision. But maybe he's right. Um, and she asks him about where to go, where he would go. The college has temporary emergency accommodations for employees who are burned or driven out of their homes. And then rebuilding, fortifying, doing whatever we can do to live and be safe. Would you ever think about leaving here, heading north to where water isn't such a problem and food is cheaper? No. He stared into space. My job down here is as secure as a job can be. There are no jobs up there. Newcomers work for food if they work at all. Experience doesn't matter. Education doesn't matter. There are just too many desperate people. They work their lives away for a sack of beans and they live on the streets. <sighs> God, you know, like this is all just a far more extreme example of what's already going on now. First of all, I would like to register, and this has been true throughout this book, but I don't think I really gave it as much thought until these chapters um, as I should have. This is, you know, kind of, it's something that I keep talking about as being like a post-apocalyptic thing. It's not really. It is apocalyptic in that the world seems to be ending slowly, um, but it hasn't happened yet. And what's so interesting about the way that this story is set up is that everybody is trying desperately to pretend like things are still okay. And I don't feel like I have adequately acknowledged how many people are in denial about how bad it is and how many people are like, you know, her friend, they have grown up knowing this world as it is, and nothing different. So they can't understand how bad it is, because they don't have anything to compare it to. And thus, they are in way more denial about what has happened and how far there is yet to go, because they don't realize how much they still have to lose. Because in their eyes, they don't really have anything. But even what they've got is more than some people have, which is why folks keep breaking in. And this whole thing about like education doesn't matter. Like, you know, I've got schooling in here that means something and I can make a living. But if we go up north, people who are as educated as me are just working like basically he he's talking about like the equivalent of minimum wage jobs. This is again, a more extreme version of minimum wage jobs. I am paying back $400 a month in student loans, and I'm expected to pay an additional $250 a month in taxes. And yet, I can't buy groceries. I can't, you know, like, it's just, it's, a, it, is it all much more intense? Yes. But is it the same principle? 100% absolutely. Um, and he says, you've got to sneak into Oregon if you get in at all. Even harder to sneak into Washington. People get shot every day trying to sneak into Canada. Nobody wants California trash. But people do leave. People are always moving north. They try. They're desperate and they have nothing to lose. 
but I do. This is my home. Beyond taxes, I don't owe a penny on it. You and your brothers have never known a hungry day here, and God willing, you never will. In my Earth Seed notebook, I've written, A tree cannot grow in its parents' shadows. Is it necessary to write things like that? Everyone knows them. What do they mean now, anyway? What does this one mean if you live in a cul-de-sac with a wall around it? What does it mean if you're damned lucky to live in a cul-de-sac with a wall around it? I like these moments where she's really like thinking to herself about the fact that she's so frustrated and then kind of judging herself for being as frustrated as she is. Um, yeah, she's just got a self-awareness that I admire and that I really like. So Tracy Dunn, um, whose daughter, the daughter that I think was a product of like an incestuous rape who died um, with that freak accident, the shooting that went through the wall. She got really depressed, even though it didn't seem like she gave a shit about her daughter. And she has disappeared and they never wind up finding her. They never find her body. They never find out what happened to her. She's just gone and nothing. That's the part of this that I find so like um, kind of. I don't even want to just say upsetting because obviously there's so much about this that's upsetting, but that has always been something to me. That's like when you hear about unsolved mysteries and people who have disappeared, that constant uncertainty and not knowing for sure that they're gone. That is the kind of thing that really makes me feel like I'm in a living nightmare uncertainty. If I know somebody's gone and I can get closure and move on with my life, as horrific as it is to lose somebody that way, it's a really quantifiable, tangible, I have this loss and I have my grief and these are the things. But if you have somebody who disappears and you don't know if they're going to come back or if they did, how they would even like be that's so frightening. And this world is so much more savage than ours, that anything that happens to her is probably worse than what I can even imagine, especially considering what winds up happening later to Keith, which we will get to. Um, so um, Lauren continues to um, do some writing about God. Um, Tracy Dunn has not come home and has not been found by the police. I don't think she will be. Um, Bianca Montoya is pregnant. It isn't just gossip. It's true. And it matters somehow. Bianca is 17, unmarried and out of her mind about Jorge Iturbe, who lives at the Ibarra house and is Yolanda Ibarra's brother. Jorge admits to being the father. I don't know why they didn't just get married before everything got so public. Jorge is 23 and he at least ought to have some sense. Anyway, they're going to get married now. The Ibarra and Iturbe families have been feuding with the Montoyas for a week over this. So stupid. You'd think they had nothing else to do. At least they're both Latino. No interracial feud this time. Last year, when Craig Dunn, who's white and one of the saner members of the Dunn family, was caught making love to Citi Moss, who's black, and Richard Moss's oldest daughter to boot, I thought someone was going to get killed. But my point isn't who's sleeping with whom or who's feuding. My point is, my question is, how in the world can anyone get married and make babies with things the way they are now? I mean, I know people have always gotten married and had kids, but now, now there's nowhere to go, nothing to do. A couple gets married, and if they're lucky, they get a room or a garage to live in with no hope of anything better and every reason to expect things to get worse. Yeah, again, I feel you. Like, this is one of those things that uh, things aren't as bad now as they could be, obviously. But they are much worse than they used to be, and they could continue to get worse. And there's not a lot in my mind to indicate that they won't get worse. And people continuing to have children, it's not only like the future that awaits your kids that to me seems so bleak, but also the amount of resources that it takes to raise another human being and those resources feeling slimmer and slimmer lately and just more and more far between. I just cannot understand the kind of blind faith you have to have that you believe you're going to be able to continue providing for your kid. Like, I don't have a lot of faith that I will continue to be able to provide for myself, despite everything that I have built with Unspoiled. It is not certain. Everything could go up in flames in an instant. 
And I just can't imagine having a whole other human being depending on me. It's bad enough when it's just me, but everything else is just, you know, and so people have asked me if I'm going to have absolutely fucking not. No, no, no. Children, mm -mm. I don't get it. I don't. And she says, I don't know whether Bianca is brave or stupid. Yeah, you know. Um, We had target practice today. And for the first time since I killed the dog, we found another corpse. We all saw it this time. An old woman, naked, maggoty, half eaten and beyond disgusting. That did it for Aura Moss. She says she won't do any more target shooting. Not ever. I tried talking to her, but she says it's the men's job to protect us anyway. She says women shouldn't have to practice with guns. What if you have to protect your younger brothers and sisters? I asked her. She has to babysit them often enough. I already know how to do that, she said. Uh, you get rusty without practice, I said. I'm not going out again, she insisted. It's none of your business. I don't have to go. I couldn't move her. She was afraid, and that made her defensive. Dad said I should have waited until the memory of the corpse faded, then try to convince her. He's right, I guess. It's the Moss attitude that gets me. Richard Moss lets his wives and daughters pull things like this. He works them like slaves in his gardens and rabbit-raising operation and around the house, but he lets them pretend they're ladies when it comes to any community effort. If they don't want to do their part, he always backs them up. This is dangerous and stupid. It's a breeding ground for resentment. No Moss woman has ever stood a watch. I'm not the only one who's noticed. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. This, like, trying to keep up a... Uh, patriarchal like benevolent sexism thing while everybody's trying to equally distribute work and you aren't willing to participate in that that's an interesting i i like this detail like it's just such a uh human again trying to cling to this like old-fashioned relic of gendered work be like that's really based on the best of times, you know, when everything is going well, well, then women do this and men do this. And it's like, first of all, that's garbage. But even if it weren't garbage, that only worked when we had the resources and the strength and the, you know, territory and health and whatever. We don't have that anymore. That shit doesn't fly now. Um, so, and when she talks about, um, Wardell Parish, um, the two oldest pain kids went with us for the first time. Bad luck for them. They weren't scared off, though. Doyle and Margaret, there's a toughness to them. They're all right. Their uncle Wardell Parish hadn't wanted them to go. He had made nasty comments about dad's ego, about private armies and vigilantes, about his taxes, how he had paid enough in his life to have a right to depend on the police to protect him, blah, blah, blah. Which is really like, Maybe he has, but that's not how it works anymore. Again, clinging to what used to be. Um, the only power that, let's see, he's not Doyle and Margaret's father, and their mother, Rosalie Payne, doesn't like anyone telling her how to raise her five kids. The only power she has in the world is her authority over her children and her money. She does have a little money inherited from her parents. Her brother has somehow lost his, so his trying to tell her what to do or what she shouldn't let her kids do was a dumb move. He should have known better, though for the kids' sake, I'm glad he didn't. My brother Keith begged to go with us as usual. He'll turn, he'll turn 13 in a few days, August 14th, and the thought of waiting two more years until he's 15 must seem impossible to him. I understand that. Waiting is terrible. Waiting to be older is worse than other kinds of waiting because there's nothing you can do to make it happen faster. Poor Keith. Poor me. Yeah, so, Keith... It's not fair, he said today for the 20th or 30th time. Lauren's a girl and you let her go. You always let her do things. I could learn to help you guard and scare off robbers. He had once made the mistake of offering to help shoot robbers instead of scaring them off. And dad all but preached him a sermon. Dad almost never hits us, but he can be scary without lifting a finger. So, Keith. This kid. It escalates slowly. Keith stole the key to the front gate from Corey, his mom. Keith is, is Lauren's half-brother. And he sneaks out. Not 
sure what his goal was in the first place. But he winds up being tossed back inside. Um, Keith is on the ground, only wearing his underwear. They stole his shoes, his pants, his shirt, the key to the front gates, which means they have to change the lock, which means for now, like until they can do that, they have to have an extra watch up because these people could just saunter right the fuck in. And the fact that he lost shoes, which are super, super expensive, like this is just some bullshit. Keith got beat up like he's bloody. He had thought he was going to prove himself, but just didn't think through anything because he's a child. And this whole thing, um, dad never hit him. The last night he must have been tempted. Why would you do such a thing? He kept demanding. How could any son of mine be so stupid? Where are your brains, boy? What did you think you were doing? I'm talking to you. Answer me. Keith answered and answered and answered, but the answers never seemed to make much sense to dad. I ain't no baby no more, he wept. Or I wanted to show you. I just wanted to show you. You always let Lauren do stuff. Or I'm a man. I shouldn't be hiding in the house, hiding in the wall. I'm a man. It went on and on because Keith refused to admit he had done anything wrong. He wanted to show he was a man, not a scared girl. It wasn't his fault that a gang of guys jumped him, beat him, robbed him. He didn't do anything. It wasn't his fault. Yo. If I, I just swear to God, this kid, I hate him so much. Like, I just started to hate him. So this is the kind of thing I can, I can forgive being a stupid 13 year old boy and sneaking out and doing something dumb like this. If you come back getting beaten up and robbed and realize you made a mistake, but he doesn't even do that. He comes back after getting the shit kicked out of him and tries to act like that wasn't the most predictable thing ever. Has he not seen the world out there? Like, they go to church. They have to ride their bikes to church. He passes through the absolute hellscape that is the world and yet does not seem to think that shit's going to happen to him. It's this... Dis it's a combination of things. There's obviously denial, but there's also that, like, childlike feeling of, of I guess, being, like, What's the word I want when nothing can hurt you? Um, it, there's Im immortal, but like, I'm trying to think, Ugh, you guys know what I'm talking about. That it just seems like he really doesn't believe that something bad could ever happen. And I'm, I'm just, you know, I don't, I know that to a degree I had that in my life, but I don't think I ever really was without anxiety about any anything happening like he just really seems shocked that anybody would target him he was a child dressed in decent clothing alone with no weapon he went out with like a knife or something he had nothing to defend himself of course you're going to get robbed anybody in their right mind would tell you that and the fact that you're acting like well everything would have been fine if i didn't get robbed is like Jumping in the pool and trying to grab something off the bottom of the pool and almost drowning and being like, well, everything would have been fine if there wasn't so much water in the pool. That is what the pool is, guy. That's what the world is. So this is the, f like, the first time that there's a real rift between everybody because he has to wind up getting in, getting up in front of the church and apologizing to everybody for putting everybody in danger. Um, and finally, like he, he winds up saying like, Oh, I've done something wrong and I won't do it again, but it doesn't actually sink in. Um, he of course leaves again. They gave Keith a BB gun because it is as close to a real gun as they could do. Um, 
Keith shot a few more pigeons and crows, threatened to shoot Marcus. Then yesterday he took off for parts unknown. He took the BB gun with him, of course. No one has seen him for about 18 hours, and there's not much doubt he's gone outside again. Dad went out looking for Keith today. He even called the police. Corey's even more upset than Dad. She's scared and jumpy and sick to her stomach, and she keeps crying. Um, He's gone for a couple of days. And when her father comes home again, Corey starts screaming at him, you didn't try. You could have found him if you'd tried. If you were your precious Lauren out there alone, you would have found her by now. You don't care about Keith. She never said anything like that before. I mean, we were always Corey and Lauren. She never asked me to call her mother, and I never thought to do it. I always knew she was my stepmother, but still, I always loved her. It mystified me that Keith was her favorite, but it didn't make me love her any less. I was her kid, but not her kid. Not quite. Not really. But I always thought she loved me. She didn't mean it. She loves you as though you were her daughter, Lauren. I just looked at him. She wants you to know she's sorry. I nodded, and after a few more assurances, he went. Is she sorry? I don't think so. Did she mean it? She did. Oh, yes, she meant it. Shit. Keith came back last night. He just walked into the house during dinner as though he'd been outside playing football instead of gone since Saturday. And this time he looked fine, not a mark on him. He was wearing a clean new set of clothing, even new shoes. All of it was much better quality than he had when he left, and much more expensive than we could have afforded. He still had the BB gun until Dad took it away from him and smashed it. Keith wouldn't say where he'd been or how he'd gotten the new things, so Dad beat him bloody. I've only seen Dad like that once before, when I was twelve. Corey tried to stop him, tried to pull him off Keith, screamed at him in English, then in Spanish, then without words. Gregory threw up on the floor, and Bennett started to cry. Marcus backed away from the whole scene and slipped out of the house. Then it was over. Keith was crying like a two-year-old, and Corey was holding him. Dad stood over both of them, looking dazed. I followed Marcus out the back door and stumbled and almost fell down the back steps. I didn't know what I was doing. Marcus wasn't around. I sat on the steps in the warm darkness and let my body shake and hurt and vomit in helpless empathy with Keith. Then I guess I passed out. Keith has gone outside again. He went yesterday afternoon. Corey didn't admit until tonight that he took not only her key this time, but her gun. He took the Smith & Wesson. Dad refused to go out and look for him. Dad slept in his office last night. He's sleeping there again tonight. I never liked my brother much. I hate him now for what he's doing to the family, for what he's doing to my father. I hate him. Damn, I hate him. So, Keith, let's let's wrap this story up because it's upsetting. Keith continues this pattern of coming home, making sure to time it so that he's only coming to the house when Lauren's father isn't there. When he comes home, He brings money for his mom and he brings little presents and treats for his full brothers and for Lauren and Marcus. He does not bring anything and then looks very purposefully at them like, ha ha, fuck you, which at first, like Lauren, of course, is annoyed and hurt by this. But when she finds out later where everything is coming from. She does not regret how she hasn't received anything from him because of where it's coming from. Um, Keith is scum. Like, this is a kid. There's something wrong with him. This isn't just like, you know, when we talk about nature versus nurture, obviously, I think it's a combo. I think people are born with a certain type of personality. And then however they are raised sends that personality in certain directions. And Keith is somebody who could be, he is definitely a sociopath. I think he could be a straight up psychopath. Um, I'm, to be honest, not familiar enough with the distinction between those terms to tell you, but he seems like somebody who enjoys hurting people. It's not just like, I'll do what it takes, but I think he kind of gets off on it a little bit and he could grow more to be like that as he got older. And, He is so 
he like Lauren pinpoints the the moment that her father beat the shit out of Keith as the moment that their family became ripped apart. And I think she's right. I think that is like that was the moment where her father did something that Corey could not forgive or look past anymore. Corey, for her part, I just don't have any respect for. And I feel bad because I feel like Lauren feels the same way in a lot of ways. And she does love the woman because of like what she represents and how she's helped take care of everybody. But Corey is in such denial. I mean, the last episode that I did on this book, we have the fight between Lauren's dad and Corey, and she's making these feeble arguments and is living in this fantasy world. And we see that again here, not only with like how she refuses to acknowledge what her son is doing, how she is taking money from him and not really like wanting to know where it came from. Like she asks, but asks in that way where he really don't tell me. And then later when there's that whole thing with the, um, the compound that gets opened up on uh, that Island, she's like, as it's basic math, when they sit down and do the actual math, there would not be enough money to cover everything that all of their expenses. And yet she keeps pushing it like this is going to be the answer. Despite the fact that right in front of her face is the evidence that this can't work without us sacrificing something. And that something would be our freedom, we would go there and never be able to leave. Which I guess, if you feel like you're never going to be free anyway, you don't feel like you're missing out on much by sacrificing your freedom because you're not feeling like you're really free. But it's such a concession to make. And it's such a, um, it's such an enormous thing to ask of somebody like Lauren's dad, when he is so clearly the person that he is, the person who constantly values self sufficiency and freedom and, um, and community over, you know, being ruled by basically what would equate to like a feudal system, except that it's a company instead of like a lord. Um, I just, it's like she doesn't, she's just living in a fantasy. That's all I can say. And like, I think we all know people like this. And I just as much as reality hurts, as much as it sucks to like, open your eyes and see things for the way they are. I cannot respect somebody who continues to bury their head in the sand. And that goes double for somebody who has a bunch of children depending on them. You cannot afford to be that kind of person when you have other human lives depending on you. If it's just you, is it stupid and still like something I don't respect? Sure. But it doesn't have the same harm to it. If it's just you, you're only hurting yourself. Okay, fine. I don't think it's smart. I don't like it. But you have the right to do to yourself what you feel like doing. But when you have a bunch of children that are relying on you, you cannot be like this. You have to face facts for their sake, if not for your own sake. And she's just not willing to do that. And so this whole thing with Keith, like, you know, we we read about how she's let him get away with everything. He'll like steal things and she knows that he has or he'll like pull some shit and she'll know that he has, but she doesn't call him out on any of it. And that's part of what makes Lauren feel like Keith feels free to continue doing that stuff because he knows he's not going to get in trouble because Corey will stand up for him or defend him or cover it up or whatever. Um, Which, you know, like this whole, there's really something to be said for the fact that he's her favorite. And he's just not like he's he's obviously got some bad tendencies that she seems to think are just like harmless somehow. But also the fact that Keith keeps on pointing out how Lauren's a girl. And I just really want to know where he's getting this like gendered idea of what Lauren should be able to do. Because obviously, if Lauren's dad is teaching her how to do this stuff, he's not getting it from her. So the only person I feel like he could be getting it from is from Corey. And we don't hear her talk like this, but like otherwise it's people in the in the town, I guess, that he hangs out with. And I don't feel like that would sink in as much as it does it as as much as it seems like it has. So 
I'm just really curious about this. Like, what is what is his deal in resenting Lauren so specifically for being a girl and being able to do like where where is he getting those values from? Um. So anyway, Keith begins to um, leave and come back quite regularly with like tons of space between when he leaves and comes back. Um, we have a jump of, of like months and months at one point. It's, uh, I think, October when we see him. And then we go to um, June. And she talks about how like he's almost 14 years old and that he has grown so much over the time that he's gone. Um, and this is a weird scene because it's him and Lauren alone together. And they don't really talk by themselves. But um, her father is at college and is going to be gone overnight because it's not safe to travel during the night. So it's best if you leave at dawn to go somewhere and then leave that place at dawn to come home. Um, And Corey was with one of her friends who just had another baby. So she's over at that person's place. So when he comes over, it's just her and He's talking about how he got a room in a building with some other people. Translation, he and his friends were squatting in an abandoned building. Who were his ga- his friends? A gang, a flock of prostitutes, a bunch of astronauts flying high on drugs, a den, on thie- a den of thieves, all of the above. Whenever he came to see us, he brought money to Corey and little gifts to Bennett and Gregory. How could he get the money? There's no honest way. So she makes him food. And he kind of wants to know, like, he's like, you're going to cook for me. You don't even like me. And she's like, yeah, I've, I have don't. She says, don't be stupid. You think I couldn't act the way you did? Skip out on my responsibilities if I felt like it? I don't feel like it. You want to eat or not? I made rabbit stew and acorn bread, enough for Corey and all the boys when they came in. He hung around and watched me work for a while, then began to talk to me. He's never done that before. We've never, never liked each other, he and I. But he had information I wanted, and he seemed to want to talk. I must have been the safest person he could talk to. He wasn't afraid of shocking me. He didn't care much what I thought, and he wasn't afraid I'd tell Dad or Corey anything, he said. Of course I wouldn't. Why cause them pain? I've never been much for tattling on people anyway. It's just a nasty old building on the outside, he was saying of his new home. You wouldn't believe how great it looks once you go in, though. Whorehouse or spaceship? I asked. It's got stuff like you never saw, he evaded. TV windows you go through instead of just sitting and looking at. Headsets, belts, and touch rings. You see and feel everything. Do anything. Anything. There's places and things you can get into with that equipment that are insane. You don't ever have to go into the street except to get food. And whoever owns this stuff took you in. Yeah. Why? He looked at me for a long time, then started to laugh. Because I can read and write, he said at last. And none of them can. They're all older than me, but not one of them can read or write anything. They stole all this great stuff, and they couldn't even use it. Before I got there, they even broke some of it because they couldn't read the instructions. And she thinks about how he didn't even want to learn to read. (laughs) Corey and I had a hell of a struggle teaching him to read and write. He had been bored, impatient, anything but eager. So you read for a living. Help your new friends learn to use their stolen equipment. Yeah. And what else? Nothing else. What a piss poor liar he is. Always was. He's got no conscience. He just isn't smart enough to tell convincing lies. Drugs, Keith, I asked. Prostitution, robbery. I said nothing else. You always think you know everything. I sighed. You're not done causing Dad and Corey pain, are you? Not by a long shot. He looked as though he wanted to shout back at me or hit me. He might have done one or the other if I hadn't mentioned Corey. I don't give a shit about him, he said, his face low and ugly. He had a man's voice already. He had everything but a man's brain. I do more for her than he does. I bring her money and nice things, and my friends, my friends know she lives here and they let this place alone. He's nothing. I turned and looked at him and saw my father's face, light-skinned, younger, thinner, but my father's face, unmistakable. He's you, I whispered. Every time I look at you, I see him. Every time you look at him, you see yourself. Dog shit. At last, he said, did he ever hit you? Not for about five years. Why'd he hit you back then? And it turns out her dad caught her having sex at 12 under the bushes. 
And uh, when he tries to say, I bet you he didn't beat you as bad as me, she tells him about how I told I uh, as I remember, I told you I fell down the back steps. He frowned, perhaps remembering my face had been memorable. Dad hadn't beaten me as bad as he beat Keith, but I looked worse. He should remember that. He ever beat up Mama? I shook my head. No, I've never seen any sign of it. I don't think he would. He loves her, you know. He really does. Bastard. He's our father, and he's the best man I know. Did you think that when he beat you? No, but later when I figured out how stupid I'd been, I was just glad he was so strict. And back when it happened, I was just glad he didn't quite kill me. He laughed again, twice in just a few minutes and both times at things I'd said. Maybe he was ready to open up a little now. So, then he tells her about the fact that he, uh, when he went out there first, he tells her, like, sleeping in a cardboard box, um, that when you have a gun that you can get anything, he stole a sleep sack from this old guy. The old guy had some money. I used it to buy food. Um, I talked to this guy. He said he was going to Alaska. God damn, Alaska. Good luck to him, I said. He's got a lot of guns to face before he gets there. He won't get there. Alaska must be a thousand miles from here. More than that, but good luck to him anyhow. It's a goal that makes sense. He had $23,000 in his pack. I didn't say anything. I just froze, stared at him in disgust and renewed dislike. But of course, of course. You wanted to know, he said. That's what it's like outside. If you've got a gun, you're somebody. If you don't, you're shit. And a lot of people out there don't have guns. I thought most of them did, except the ones too poor to be worth robbing. I thought so too, but guns cost a lot. And it's easier to get one if you already got one, you know? What if that Alaska guy had had one? You'd be dead. I sneaked up on him while he was sleeping, just sort of followed him until he went off the road to go to sleep. Then I got him. He led me away from L.A., though. You shot him? That nasty smile again. He talked to you. He was friendly to you. And you shot him. What was I supposed to do? Wait for God to come and give me some money? What was I supposed to do? Come home? Shit. Doesn't it even bother you that you took someone's life? You killed a man? He seemed to think about that for a while. Then he shook his head. It don't bother me, he said. I was scared at first, but then... After I did it, I didn't feel nothing. Nobody saw me do it. It just... I took his stuff and left him there. Besides, maybe he wasn't dead. People don't always die just because you shot them. You didn't check. I just wanted his stuff. He was crazy anyway. Alaska. I didn't say any more to him. Didn't ask any more questions. He talked a little about meeting some guys and joining up with them, then discovering that even though they were all older he, than he was, none of them could read or write. He was a help to them. He made their lives pleasanter. Maybe that's why they didn't just wait until he was asleep and kill him and take his loot for themselves. After a while, he noticed that I wasn't saying anything, and he laughed. You better marry Curtis and make babies, he said. Out there, outside, you wouldn't last a day. That hyper-empathy shit of yours would bring you down even if nobody touched you. You think that, I said. Hey, I saw a guy get both of his eyes gouged out. After that, they set him on fire and watched him run around and scream and burn. You think you could stand to see that? Your new friends did that, I asked. Hell no, crazies did that. Paints. They shave off all their hair, even their eyebrows, and they paint their skin green or blue or red or yellow. They eat fire and kill rich people. They do what? They take that drug that makes them like to watch fires. Sometimes a campfire or a trash fire or a house fire. Or sometimes they grab a rich guy and set him on fire. Why? I don't know. They're crazy. I heard some of them used to be rich kids, so I don't know why they hate rich people so much. That drug is bad, though. Sometimes the paints like the fire so much, they get too close to it. Then their friends don't even help them. They just watch them burn like, I don't know. It's like they were fucking the fire and like it was the best fuck they ever had. You've never tried it? Hell no. I told you, these guys are crazy. You know, even the girls shave their heads. Damn, they look ugly. They're mostly kids, then? Yeah, your age up to maybe 20. There's a few old ones, 25, even 30. I hear most of them don't live that long, though. So, yeah. This is, like, just such a... Uh. He comes back one more time, 
gives her some money and tries to get her to take it for her birthday. And then when she's like, I don't want it, he tells her to give it to Corey and she agrees to do that. Um, today, my parents had to go downtown to identify the body of my brother, Keith. I haven't been able to write a word since Wednesday. I don't know what to write. The body was Keith's. I never saw it, of course. Dad said he tried to keep Corey from seeing it. The things someone had done to Keith before he died. I don't want to write about this, but I need to. Sometimes writing about a thing makes it easier to stand. Someone had cut and burned away most of my brother's skin. Everywhere except his face. They burned out his eyes, but left the rest of his face intact, like they wanted him to be recognized. They cut and they cauterized, and they cut and they cauterized. Some of the wounds were days old. Someone had an endless hatred of my brother. Dad got us all together and described to us what he had been done. He told us in a flat, dead monotone. He wanted to scare us, to scare Marcus, Bennett, and Gregory in particular. He wanted us to understand just how dangerous the outside is. The police said drug dealers torture people the way Keith was tortured. They torture people who steal from them and people who compete with them. We don't know whether Keith was doing either of those things. We just know he's dead. His body was dumped in front of a burned out old building that was once a nursing home on the broken concrete abandoned several hours after Keith died. It could have been dumped in one of the canyons and only the dogs would have found it, but someone wanted it to be found, wanted it to be recognized. Had one of his victims, relatives or friends managed to get even at last. And it's just such a fucking, like the whole thing is so horrible. Like, there, there's so many layers to what's horrible about this. And what I like is that whenever you see this sort of story told in a very surface way, where a kid goes off and starts to like live a pretty shit life and do terrible things, people act like the family just tolerates it. But to a degree, most of the time, there is not a whole lot that a family can do. Um, it's just not, it's not in their power to, and it shouldn't be like, this is somebody's decision and actions that they are, they have responsibility over and they're making that choice for themselves. And, um, people don't think about the way that they act like, oh, they're just standing by and letting this happen. They don't think about the effect that this person is having on the family because of the division that these kinds of actions cause. And anybody who has been in a family with an addict who started to get really out of control knows this story really well. Keith wasn't an addict specifically, ex except in a way he was an addict to like proving himself. It was like a toxic masculinity thing, really. Like he couldn't bear to be under her father's thumb, even though he was 13. He was still a kid um, when he left. So by the time he's dead, he's like 14, maybe. Um, and this whole, like, it's so hard to watch because everybody wants to give the person a chance to make good, to do better, to come home, to fix what they've done. And so people keep giving them chances. And to the outside, that makes it look like you're just letting it happen but if they're your family, what are you supposed to do? Just like completely turn your back on them the instant they do something wrong? And when do you draw the line in the sand that says, okay, now you've gone too far and now I am turning my back on you? It's a really tough thing to quantify. And it's never uh, to the outside going to look like the right decision. And seeing it from the inside here and the way that the family just is torn apart by it. Corey cried all day, most of the time without making a sound. She's been crying off and on since Wednesday. Marcus and Dad tried to comfort her. Even I tried, though the way she looked at me, as though I had something to do with Keith's death, as though she almost hated me. I keep reaching out to her. I don't know what else to do. Maybe in time she'll forgive me for not being her daughter, for being alive when her son is dead, for being Dad's daughter by somebody else. I don't know. Dad never shed a tear. I've never seen him cry in my life. Today, I wish he would. I wish he could. And she thinks about the fact that she hasn't cried either. 
and that she didn't notice that she hadn't cried until Curtis brings it up and is like, you know, you can cry in front of me. It's okay. Um, and she thinks about how she d- isn't crying because she kind of hated him. Uh, he was also the most sociopathic person I've ever been close to. He would have been a monster if he'd been allowed to grow up. Maybe he was one already. He never cared what he did. If he wanted to do something and it wouldn't cause him, cause him immediate physical pain, he did it. Fuck the earth. He messed up our family, broke it into something less than a family. Still, I would never have wished him dead. I would never wish anyone dead in that horrible way. I think he was killed by monsters much worse than himself. It's beyond me how one human being could do that to another. If hyperempathy syndrome were a more common complaint, people couldn't do such things. They could kill if they had to and bear the pain of it or be destroyed by it. But if everyone could feel everyone else's pain, who would torture? Who would cause anyone unnecessary pain? I've never thought of my problem as something that might do the go- do some good before, but the way things are, I think it would help. I wish I could give it to people. Failing that, I wish I could find other people who have it and live among them. A biological conscience is better than no conscience at all. Yeah, that's something. So then she talks about how the community is coming apart. And this is one of those things like that just begins to happen in there's always a golden period where things seem to be working pretty well and inevitably change change that's her whole thing right god is change um these robbers come in and they kill an old lady um and people are just really starting to get scared and like much more paranoid Um, This is the seventh incident since Keith was killed. More and more people are coming over our wall to take what we have or what they think we have. So I wonder if Keith was protecting them in a way outside because of the fact that his family was the one who lives here. And now that protection is gone. Um, Or if it's a combo of like that and just things getting more desperate. But Corey and dad have been using some of the money Keith brought us to help the people who've been robbed. Stolen money to help victims of theft. Half the money is hidden in our backyard in case of disaster. There's always been some money hidden out there. Now there's enough to make a difference. The other half has gone to the church fund to help our neighbors in emergencies. It won't be enough. Something new is beginning, or perhaps something old and nasty is reviving. Yo. Yo. Is that not just the, like, perfect phrase for what is going on right now in our world? So this is when we hear about a company that took over a small coastal city called Olivar. What it is, is they um, like were just rich enough to get by for a lot longer than other places, but not rich enough to sustain themselves. And so eventually when they needed help, it was just not enough of a crucial like emergency situation. And they finally decided that in order to stay livable, they were going to have to sell their township to this company who are going to turn basically the entire town into a desalination plant, Um, basically, you know, turning seawater into fresh potable water since water is such a high price commodity right now. Um. Her father, obviously, does not think this is a good idea. Corey says, I think the whole idea is wonderful. It's what we need. Now, if some now if only some big company would want to do the same thing with Robledo. No, Dad said. Thank God, no. You don't know. Why shouldn't they? Robledo's too big, too poor, too black, and too Hispanic to be of interest to anyone, and it has no coastline. What does it have? Street poor, body dumps, memory of once being well off, shade trees, big houses, hills and canyons. Most of those things are still there, but no company will want us. And this is the beginning of this like real rift between Corey and Lauren's father. Um, Olivar doesn't sound like slavery, but those rich people. Um, let's see. Marcus says Olivar doesn't sound like slavery. Those rich people would never let themselves be slaves. Dad gave him a sad smile. Not now, he said. Not at first. 
Kagamoto, Stam, Frampton, Japanese, German, Canadian, when I was young, people said it would come to this. Well, why shouldn't other countries buy what's left of us if we put it up for sale? I wonder how many of the people in Olivar have any idea what they're doing. I don't think many do, I said. I don't think they'd dare let themselves know. He looked at me and I looked back. I'm still learning how dogged people can be in denial, even when their freedom or their lives are at stake. He's lived with it longer. I wonder how. Marcus said, Lauren, you ought to want to go to some place like Olivar more than anyone. You share pain every time you see someone get hurt. There'd be a lot less pain in Olivar. And there would be all those guards, I said. I've noticed that people who have a little bit of power tend to use it. All those guards KSF is bringing in, they won't be allowed to bother the rich people, at least at first. But new, bare-bones, work-for-room-and-board employees? I'll bet they're, they'll be fair game. There is no reason to believe the company would allow that kind of thing, Corey said. Why do you always expect the worst of everyone? When it comes to strangers with guns, I told her, I think suspicion is more likely to keep you alive than trust. She made a sharp, wordless dis sound of disgust. You know nothing about the world. You think you have all the answers, but you know nothing. I didn't argue. There wasn't much point in my arguing with her. Yo, listen. So this argument turns into a full-blown thing that everybody starts talking about, like this whole thing with Olivar. And eventually, Corey applies, um, the Garfields apply, and... As all of this is happening, Lauren's realizing that she has started to re started to see the cracks forming in their community, that if all of these people are looking to leave, it's only a matter of time before everything starts to, like, crumble. Um, and then the start of Chapter 12. Uh, the Garfields have been accepted at Olivar. She has a conversation with um, the this girl, that the one that turned her in. Um, Joe and the one that told her dad about the fact that she was trying to like educate everybody about f f running away. Um, maybe the security Joanne will find in Oliver is the only kind of security to be had for anyone who isn't rich. To me though, security in Olivar isn't much more attractive than the security Heath has finally found in his urn. You know, there's something to be said for that. And then comes the worst part. Dad didn't come home today. He was due this morning. I don't know what that means. I don't know what to think. I'm scared to death. And this turns into the rest of the chapter is just a search party. Um, over and over again, spanning days. And because it's a search party, they have to specifically let themselves, make themselves, look at things that they haven't looked at before. And this means there are rotting corpses and body parts and blood and just all kinds of horror out there that they have made themselves ignore. And now they have to investigate it all in order to see if this is their father laying here. And there's an arm hanging from a tree that could be her dad's and they take the fingerprints off of it. It turns out to not be. So by the end of chapter 12, there is a, um, gathering at the church on Sunday as usual. And Lauren goes up and makes a speech about how everybody needs to be strong and stick together and fight for a better future because letting ourselves slide into despair won't work for anyone. And she's, purposely trying to like not let this Sunday service turn into like a funeral for her dad, even though she knows that everybody pretty much is assuming at this point that he's dead. Even she is. And this is awful. And I don't know what's going to happen now because he didn't want to go to Olivar. But if it's just Corey in charge now, Olivar could very well be on the table. Like she might try and make them go, which is just an enormous mistake. And I don't want to see that. Um, and I'm really bummed because Lauren's dad is like the one person with any fucking sense in this place, it feels like, other than Lauren herself. And uh, yeah, it's just, this is a really compelling story. In, it, like, it just really explores the power of like human denial. One could say hope is, but hope and denial often disguise themselves as each other. Um, so yeah, 
that's a bummer, man. It ends with them not still not having found him and not knowing what happened. And I'm really worried about what that's going to look like, what he's what's going to turn out to have happened to him or if they just never find him. Obviously, if they find him, I, I want to say one is as bad as the other. That's not necessarily true. But, you know, if he was just like shot and robbed, that's less horrible than somebody doing to him, say what they did to Keith, which he's not involved in gang activity or anything that we know of. So I wouldn't think that would be the thing that happened to him. Um, but as they're out searching, she definitely hears somebody screaming that sounds like something's being done to them akin to what was done to Keith. And it does, she doesn't think it's her dad, but yeah, it's uh, one of those moments where she's like, you know what? I'm going to walk away because just hearing him doesn't trigger the the empathy. But if I see it, it will. So, all right, guys, that's about it. That's the end of this. Show. So, yeah, a lot of, uh, of, of shit happening right now. And I just don't know where the story's heading, you know? I really don't. I feel like something big is going to have to happen. Like, it's amping up to that. Like, I feel like what's it's amping up to is either everybody deserts this little community or the community gets busted down finally. Right. Like that's just, that is, it has to happen. Things are getting worse. People are getting more restless and more daring and trying to get in. And that just is going to have to lead to, you know, well, we'll see. Um, all right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for listening. And thank you again to Danique for commissioning these chapters uh, looking forward to reading more and finding out. I'm like looking forward to it and dreading it. Um, but I hope you all have enjoyed listening. Definitely check out this book and let me know what you think. And I will see you soon with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs>